Okay, so I would like to start with, uh, please bear with me, Kai, with an announcement. I would like to make an announcement, which is that I'm stepping down as the leader and facilitator of the London Stoics. Uh, so I, the reason why the, the last meeting um, in this current iteration of the London Stoics will be in July, uh, but the reason why I wanted to make an announcement now is because I'm... Um, I should go to Italy in June. I don't know yet when, and uh, I might still be there in July. So this is why I want to take the opportunity to, to do it uh, now. Uh, so, and then in August, we're going to have a break. We're going to take a break anyway. And then in September, he reaches, who is with us today. Uh, she's going to be the new leader and facilitator of the London Stoics. So we're going to open a new chapter. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm very pleased that uh, he was going to be in, in charge. Um, and I'll do a brief introduction in, in a second. Uh, so this is actually in July, it's going to be exactly five years that I've been running the London Stoics. So my very first meetup was in 26th of July of 2016. And it was with the one attendee, um, an Irish guy called Joe. So I'll say hello to Joe. Um, and um, yeah, I just wanted to take the opportunity to have uh, written names down so that I don't know, hopefully I'm not forgetting anyone. I just wanted to thank uh, everyone who contributed to the, uh, to the group, uh, starting from the uh, kind of historical members of the London Stoics, the one joined at the very beginning where we used to go to the uh, Royal Festival Hall to, to have our meetings, and then uh, successfully at the, uh, at the Senate House. And I'm talking about my friend, Paul Ryan, who's here today. And then James Clark, who was the first sort of a co-facilitator. Uh, and then we got Aware. I think I've seen him here, yeah. Hi, Aware. Um, and then we, we got a special mention to Terry and Phil Clark. Uh, Terry has been our treasurer for quite some time, and he's also facilitated a couple of meetings and then is uh, given a couple of presentations as well. Uh, Phil has helped me out with the uh, mailing list and also with the uh, running of the Facebook group and the meetup group as well. And then also all the facilitators who have uh, been facilitating throughout um, you know, the course of the last five years. I'm talking about James Clark, Anna Hewitt, Leo Barnard, uh, Tim LeBon, uh, and then lastly, Terry and Leo. Uh, okay, so, so as I said, Eve is going to be in charge from September onwards, and I'm very pleased because I was a bit concerned um, about the future of the London Stoics at one point, and it would have been sad to if this experience had to sort of uh, terminate. So I'm, I'm, hope, um, I'm glad that it's going to go on. And uh, particularly happy because I think you're going to be in safe hands with with Eve. Um, so just a couple of words about Eve, and that Eve, if you want to uh, um, complement anything uh, after this, then please feel free to do to do so. So Eve is a mentor and teacher of psychology. Uh, she's also uh, been collaborating lately. You may have seen her on a few presentations. And so she's collaborating with the Modern Stoicism team and also with the Aurelius uh, Foundation. And then most importantly, she's been running this, uh, it's a new experiment in a way, uh, an online uh, Stoicism group, uh, practice group. Um, so it's all centered around the practice of Stoicism. And it's been going on from September uh, and it will end in next month. So about nine months. Uh, and it's a new thing that needs to run in uh, sort of cooperation with the modern citizen team, uh, specifically with Tim LeBon, who's in charge of the, uh, this research project. So the same way we, they sort of evaluated the, the um, sort of the, um, I'm going to say, um, the effect of, of um, the Stoic Week uh, every year. So Tim is going to do the same with this, um, uh, with this group because um, we, we had to submit basically a survey at the very beginning of the course 
uh, just like you do with Stoic Week, and then we have we're going to submit another survey at the end. And in fact, we also submitted a survey midway through, didn't we? If, yeah. So as I said, it's a new thing because there's never, you know, we never had such a long intervention. So Stoic Week, as you know, it's only one week. Now we've got the SMRT, which is only one month. So it's going to be really interesting to see what's going to, um, you know, what the result of this. Uh, research, research project will be. Um, yeah, the, the only other thing I was going to say is that uh, Eve doesn't live in London, and so the uh, COVID or not, the group is going to stay online. Um, now, I think, if anything, I think this, this is a plus, because uh, it's going to be very inclusive. It's going to allow people to participate from wherever they want. Uh, people who got problems with, you know, commitments to the family or, or otherwise, uh, it's going to be easier for them to, to attend. And I was thinking that just to counterbalance, you know, the lack of physical contact, perhaps every now and again, uh, I'm, I'm just going to continue as a participant, just as a normal participant. But every now and again, we may want to organize a social event like we've done in the past. So in the past, we've... Um, we've we went once to the British Museum. Uh, I think once the car you were there, we went for, for a drink, isn't it, in a pub. Um, I once went to the Postman Spark. So we could be do something nice like that to, to get to know each other better. And I, and I think that's me. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to you, Eve, if you want to add anything to it. It'll let me unmute. Well, I, I just want to say thank you so much, um, Carmelo, for all your support and your endorsement. And it's, you know, it's been uh, an amazing journey over the last few months running the online group. Um, and in the autumn, I'll be uh, teaching an online course in Stoicism with the Aurelius Foundation. Um, so, yeah, it's been a, been a lot going on one way or another. Um, and I'm really looking forward to being able to, to work with all the amazing people that are contributing to the London Stoics. And I, I'm very committed to making sure that I take care of what Carmelo has built over all of these years. And that, you know, that I'm respectful of that. And I put, um, you know, I put a lot of effort in to make sure that it carries on going. I mean, I, it's a hard act to follow, I think, but, you know, I will uh, do my best. On. <laughs> I'm sure he's and, not. But thank you very much for the, for the kind. No, I'm really, you know, I'm looking forward to it, and uh, and I I will liaise with the people who have been involved um, over the summer, so that by the time we get to September, um, you know, we all we all know uh, what the best way forward is. But yeah, it's going to be great for me to for it to continue online because. Um, although I could travel to London as a long cane user, that's also quite a challenge. And um, and I'm going to be moving probably a little bit further away from London. But I love the idea of us doing some in-person meetups as well. So, yeah, I think I think we should keep that as part of the picture. And then hopefully having the uh, Zoom meetings will fit around people's family and work commitments, too. So, yeah, yeah exactly. let's let's do all of that. And thank you. I think it's, it's an honor. Thanks very much, Chip. Uh, great. So I don't want to take too much time. I'm just going to introduce Kai now. Um, so Kai is not new to the London Stoics. I think this is your third time, isn't it? You've been twice before. Um, so Kai is a researcher and lecturer in sustainability and stoicism. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, I understand that your sort of your uh, subject was sustainability and then stoicism, you added that at a later date uh, because it was originally sort of your personal interest and then became sort of a professional one as well. Is that I think it's actually my fourth time. I'm just thinking because I think I've done two online one now and then we've had two in person. So oh, really? Yeah. Okay. I know, I, I've enjoyed it. It's all blurred into one happy memory. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. So professionally speaking, like my, my day job, as it were, is actually environmental engineering. And then stoicism was a hobby and then basically took over my life as Eve will probably say the same thing happens. I think when stoicism becomes a life philosophy as opposed to a life hack or some kind of self-help tool, it actually becomes the art of living. I think that on some level one is 
whatever whatever they however you live in your your day-to-day -day life that then becomes even more stoic and so being an academic it was just natural to to move into that area i think people would say the same if they were an artist that they start to change the things they draw and think about so yeah, it, you're absolutely right. So my PhD is why I never say myself, call myself in these circles, Dr. Kai, right? Because my doctor is linked to sustainable energy materials. So I think it would be quite unfair to be going around saying I'm Dr. Kai, and then you find out later on that I'm a doctor in something entirely different. So that's why I, I make sure that people, I mean, they can call me doctor, but I, I try to stop them doing that because it's just not really reasonable in my, in my view. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so as I was saying, he's uh, currently teaching at UC Louvain in Belgium, although you're uh, uh, calling from um, Lisbon, right? No, but the Algarve. Um, right uh, yeah, I feel like that was Eurovision. You were watching Eurovision last <laughs> night. Yes, I'm, I'm Kai calling from Lisbon. Uh, you know, Neil Poir to the, to in, uh, the UK again, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so he, um, I'll, I'll actually keep a straight face because we chat every now and again in the uh, private, so I, I need to uh, be professional. So he tweets at Kai Whiting and blogs at stoickai.com. And let's just say that if you want to know more about Kai's work, all you need to do is go on YouTube, you're gonna find loads of stuff, uh, like this a beautiful presentation, which I uh, really, really like from back in 2018, the one you gave a long story called 2018, uh, I thought it was, um, yeah, very nice, uh, sort of a um, uh, quite passionate speech. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and then, then you, you take part in various podcasts, so you can find those as well on YouTube. Okay, so the way, I forgot to say that we're going to have a break at 5 p.m. Uh, so... Uh, probably 10 minutes, 10 minute, 10 minute break, yeah. And um, yeah, so the way this is gonna work is that I'm gonna be agree that I'm gonna ask Kai a few questions about the book, his book. And then I understand Kai wants to ask the audience questions. And this is uh, kind of a bit of a role reversal. <laughs> Kai being Kai, likes to do things his own way. Um, yeah, and then I guess after my question, what do you think, Kai, if after the, the question I've asked, if anyone's read your book, because your book has just come out, right, on the UK market in just this month. So yeah. I'm not sure how many people will have had the chance to uh, to read it. But if there's anyone who's read it and got a practicing question, perhaps, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll ask and we'll do that. And then you, you're going to ask a question. Okay, so without further ado, is this your first book or your... Yeah, so it's, well, it's a co-authored book, so I didn't write it by myself. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, just yeah. to make that clear, though, to my co-author, who sometimes says, sometimes it comes across that you wrote it by yourself. So I didn't, uh, because, precisely because I didn't feel comfortable writing it by myself, because I'm not a doctor in stoicism, right? So I think the best way and the most humble way to do that is to acknowledge the fact that you are not necessarily the expert or the best person in the room to, to highlight some of, these, some of these key points. So like when we get into the nitty gritty uh, about stoicism, no, that's probably not me. Right? That's somebody who spent 20 years of his life really you know, looking into what stoicism means, which is precisely why I think co-authoring is underrated, particularly in the author world. It's all about credit. For me, it's about trying to do your best that you can for your audience, and that sometimes gets lost. So that's why we co-authored. Okay. Um... And then I wondered if you could explain, I mean, I know there's just a rhetorical question, I guess, but if you can explain the title of the book, why did you choose that title? Because it's quite telling, right? Well, you know, the key is that you never choose your title, your editor chooses your title. So you tend to argue quite strongly for a title and then your editor says, I like that part, but I want this. So the bit about stoicism for a world worth living in was like Leia and, Leia and I just can stand across an eyes kind of, that's the title we wanted. And he was like, yeah, but what about people who don't know what stoicism is? And we're like, well, we don't really know what we'd call that. What would you call it? And he said, being better. So it's kind of combination. Like he, I want, you know, we wanted to really address some of the issues in, in contemporary stoic practice, uh, contemporary stoic thought and practice. And he really wanted to, to open up the, you know, the conversation. So that, that's kind of a combination of both. Like, if you don't know what stoicism is, can you use it to be better? 
Yes. And if you do know what it is, can you use it to make the world a better place? Yes. So that's why it's kind of like, uh, you know, come together in those two separate sections, because that's really what the book is about. Cool. Um, and then, yeah, why did you go for the, so your, you followed the specific format. So at the end of every chapter, I believe it's nine chapters, isn't it? At the end of every chapter, you ask uh, two, three questions to the readership. And I just wonder why did you go for that type of uh, format? Yeah, you're, you're now you're, you're letting me release all my secrets now. So that was my that was our agent, our agent came up came about. That's just really nice about when you think about a book, how collaborative it actually is. Like the fact that my name is on the book is actually really deceptive, which is why the acknowledgements are quite detailed and quite long, because we did think like Sturzum is you, one of the chapters called No One Is an Island, and that is a really good example because the agent read it and said. But well, I would like to reflect on it more. What, what's the steps we should take? And I said, there are no steps in stories and there really aren't. It depends on your role and it depends on how old you are and what you do and what you like. He's like, okay, but how can I get the audience then to think if you're telling me there's no step one, step two, step three? So he said, we can ask them a question. She said, go on, go and do that. So that came from um, our agent. It didn't come from us. So again, you've asked really cool, cool questions because it's proving a point, again, that no one is an island that I'm not necessarily the smartest person in the room, that a lot of people through that process of writing taught me more than I taught them. And the readers are teaching me as well. Now you taught me, for example, you highlighted something that I missed about Seneca. So that if we get a second edition, I'll have to make sure that that sentence about, we said that we attributed a particular paragraph to uh, Chris. contemporary stoic. Yeah, Chris, Chris, Chris Fisher. Yeah. Chris Fisher, who had actually paraphrased Seneca, which is fine. There's no issue that we, we, we mentioned a contemporary stoic, but the key is that we should have highlighted that he paraphrased Seneca. And Carmelo pointed that out to me. So if anybody does have like some something they've noticed about the book that is wrong, tell me. <laughs> We'd like to fix it. Or well, not even necessarily wrong, but you know, it could be written in a less clumsy way, definitely. And that was a really good example. I'm really open to Socratic dialogue. And again, I'm not necessarily as smart as you guys happen to be on a specific subject. So I think that's, again, that talks when people kind of grab their book and hold it like this, as if they're the owner, I think they're missing the point, especially if they're trying to be stoic about it. And I hope you're gonna be open to this next question, which is a bit of a rhetorical question, a bit of a provocation as well. Why did we need the umpteenth book on stoicism? And the reason why I'm saying that is because we just the last few years we had this I mean, a whole, literally a tsunami of uh, books about stoicism. Um, yeah. I don't think anybody needs another book. Like, I'm, that, I would be a liar if I said that we needed it, like we needed air or something. Um, what I can say is what our book focuses on, which I think contemporary stoics missed the point. There's a lot of um, contemporary stoic books that talk about the dichotomy of control. That's not even, as you know, Camilo, that's an actual modern concept. And if you read really careful Epictetus, really carefully Epictetus, it's <laughs> discourses 1.1. It's literally stories in 101. And a lot of the books, and I won't mention names because it's not for me to do that, spend 200 pages centering contemporary stoic practice and theory on Epictetus' discourses 1.1. The whole point of stoicism is virtue. And I'm not gonna lie that I've read many a stoic contemporary book that doesn't even mention virtue, that doesn't mention the word virtue ethics framework. So I don't think we needed an umpteenth book about stoicism, but I did think that we needed a book that was centered on virtue. And there are excellent academic scholarly material that does that. Uh, A.A. Long would be hands down the best with Chris, well, Christopher Gill on that subject and Julia Annis, but it's really hard for a newbie or someone who is not academically trained to really get Judah Annis. Like I think I told Eve, like when she asked me a question about virtue, I was like, I'm not the expert on this. This comes directly from Judah Annis. And she asked me a question about something else about ethics or the self. And I said, that doesn't come from me. That comes from Professor Christopher Gill. The problem is that we had this sort of divide. We kind of had the really sort of what I call popularized stoicism, which makes it so simple that we missed the point or really scholarly deep dive, which you need, it's hard. And I don't mean you have to be 
train necessarily in a, you know, I have a PhD piece of paper. No, it just takes years to access it. I'm sure John sitting there could, would be able to access it because he's a reader, but some people aren't readers and that's okay. And I didn't think there was a, Leo and I didn't think there was a bridge between those two. But if you told me, why do we need the umpteenth book about stoicism? I don't think we need, I don't, wouldn't say that we needed it. If you are capable of reading Julia Anders, Professor Chris Gill and A.A. Long, then I would say probably only read chapter seven and chapter eight of, of our book, because that's the chapters they don't read, of, yeah, chapter seven, chapter eight and chapter nine, because they don't really go into that detail. If you've read them and understood them, probably chapters one to three aren't going to be very helpful. Yeah, no, it was a bit of a provocation. Also, your book has got a specific slant, and, and that's uh, very much needed, at least in my humble opinion. Um, the next one is not a question as such, but rather a remark. Um, so you talk a lot about, you mentioned a lot of uh, contemporary figures, and that's not something that, you know, uh, a lot of the other stoic books do, as far as I know. Uh, but the people who are not specifically stoic wouldn't like to identify as stoic, stoic, but rather they could be seen as paragons of virtue, if you like. Uh, so in one way or another, they, they express virtue uh, with, their, with their actions. Um, one of these people, they're not contemporary, but you talk about the Spartans. And this, so this idea of role model is very important for the Stoics. So the Stoics believe that you know, we should look up to our role models. Uh, the Spartans were role models for the Stoics. One thing I didn't know, I knew that there were sort of this valiant sort of a warriors and that they were famous for being laconic, which is another thing that the Stoics inherited from the, uh, from the Spartans. So they had this um, predilection for a sort of a short sort of um, quotes, uh, maxims, concise maxim, and that's very much a, a Spartan thing. The one thing I didn't know is that they valued this, you know, the common good. Uh, which is, you know, uh, even more to the point. And I love that anecdote about the fact that you say when the soldiers came back from war, from battle uh, without the shield, then they would be frowned upon and they would be reprimanded because the shield was not just for their own protection, but was for the protection of their fellow soldiers as well. Uh, whereas if they came back without the helmet, that didn't really matter because the helmet, you know, it was only for their own, um, you know, it's, for their own for their own protection, exclusive protection, as it were. Correct. So, yeah, we have this sort of really interesting view of like, you know, stoicism and Sparta. I'm being like in the gym. I can imagine all the CrossFit is like jumping up and down being Sparta. And it really misses the point that Spartan war exactly <laughs> exactly it misses the point that Spartan the Spartan really had the view that was what was good for Sparta was good for the Spartan, right? And they actually went, in my personal opinion, they went too extreme in the sense of that being an individual didn't really matter in Sparta. That was you were actually actually almost beaten out of you as a soldier, right? It was literally you are Spartan, and that's completely opposite to well, you know, when we introduce ourselves, we probably say like, you know, my name is Kai. I don't introduce myself as, for example, my name is Whiting, which they do in China, that tells you something about what's important to the culture. And I'm sure the Spartans would say, I am Spartan, and then they might say their name. So I thought it was quite key that people have criticized um, my slant, as it were, to say that stoicism is more than self-help. In fact, it only functions as self-help in the sense of giving you headspace to help the community. And Sparta is, is the proof of that because it is actually a queen the, queen, the Spartan queen Adiatis, who really is the driving force behind economic and land reforms because she was fighting an oligarchical regime to free and restore to some extent uh, her people to the legendary status of Lycurgus, who's like the, the legend of Sparta. So people firstly say to me that stoicism is not about women. I'm like, so the Spartan queen who was responsible for bringing stoicism to her people, who is she then? And the people haven't done like the digging to know that. And we also say things like the Oracle. We talk about the Oracle in that chapter. And we just actually submitted a piece to the American Philosophy Association saying that the Oracle is so key and she's a woman. If it wasn't for the Oracle, there would be no stoicism. Let me paraphrase. If it wasn't for her, there would be no stoicism. And that's the problem with, with the umpteenth book, right? I didn't see any of those books talking about the role of women in, in stoicism. 
the role of the collective in Stoicism, the role of the environment in Stoicism, because again, if you only talk about what's in your control and what's not in your control, you missed the point. So that's the, I'm really glad that you said about the helmet, because it's true, if they came back with this, you know, if they'd lost their shield, they were exposing the whole unit to problems. If they lost their helmet, they were seen as brave because they'd continue to fight, even though they're at great loss to themselves. And I think that's what the book is about. Great. Um, my next question is about, you, uh, you mentioned, about, I think, more than one American entrepreneur who was uh, who were basically quite uh, uh, enlightened in the sense that they wanted to um, better the, you know, the, um, that their workforce in the sense that they they increased their that you know their paycheck and, and stuff, and uh, one of those was uh, price. Okay, and I'm uh, reading from from your book. Um, this entrepreneur called Price, who just uh, increased the, uh, the 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 wages of uh, his uh, workforce. Um, so I'm, I'm reading, uh, I'm quoting. Many in such quarters labeled Price as socialist. Even talk show host Trevor Noah uh, did so in a tongue in cheek attempt to show how pervasive the misuse of the term socialism has become in America. When used in a derogatory fashion to derail anyone who attempts to use capitalist mechanism, mechanisms to share the fruits of its spoils, the term really is nothing more than a thinly veiled threat leveled by those who are frightened of losing power and privilege in the game they have rigged. Make no mistake, that is not capitalism, that is bullying. And as for doing the right thing for the right reason, that's not socialism, that's stoicism. So my question to you is, are you insinuating that the idea form of government for a stoic would be socialism? No, it would be anarchy. Zeno, <laughs> Zeno, I mean, you, yeah, <laughs> that's even better, isn't it? Why? Let me explain. I mean, we've literally just wrote this in the American philosophy piece, so it's really on the top of my head. But Zeno's Republic is the ideal Stoic society. It's the Republic. It is not the ideal Stoic, which is, again, what we thought with the umpteenth book, which is a really good question. I'm going to steal it. But why we thought that, the, that we needed a book was because they always talk about what it is to be the ideal Stoic. Zeno wasn't interested, like, I'm sorry, like to burst that massive bubble, but 2000 years ago, the bloke wrote The Republic. The reason why we don't read about it is because it probably wasn't very popular compared to Plato, because Plato is instructing, he's the philosopher instructing the king about what they should do, AKA the church instructing the monarch about how they should be the good person. And Zeno was like, no, 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 it's, it should be anarchy. And it doesn't mean chaos. It means that everybody's responsible for themselves and everybody works towards the collective. So in Zeno's Republic, there's no, prop there's no private property. There's no currency. So socialism, actually socialism and capitalism are very hedonic. They're, you know, for example, uh, Karl Marx wrote his PhD on Epicureanism. So the whole thing about Marxism is that the idea that there's oppression. In Stoicism, the only way that you can be oppressed is to oppress yourself. Seneca says that we are not, you know, we're not subject to tyrants. The whole idea about suffering is not a Stoic from the way that Marx talks about it. That's a hedonic framing. So not hedonism. What I mean is that you, you, you operate virtuously in order to achieve pleasure and remove pain or suffering to be tranquil. This is Epicureanism. So the whole thing of oppression, the whole thing about the bourgeoisie having pleasure and the proles having pain and operating in that dance, that's not stoic at all. So when you say, should, I, should it be a socialist or capitalist? It's like, but well, that's not a virtue ethics framework, it's a hedonic framework. Now, if you say, should we have some aspects that are closer to, if we're going to use either capitalism or socialism, should it be have a more socialist bent? Right? Potentially, yes, I would say the NHS is a really good example in the UK, which the Americans could really do with. But it misses the point entirely that virtue ethics says, actually, it depends on your role and who you are. And again, I could talk about this for hours. I don't know how much DL we want to go into. But when you next time someone says to you that stories about self-help, just remind them that Zeno wrote Republic and smile, because I think that would just surprise a lot of people because it's, it's, not, it's not the stories that is what I would call quote unquote sexy. It's the stoicism that Silicon Valley wants to quietly sweep under the rug and pretend that Zeno never said anything. 
or Cleanthes for that matter. So it's much nicer for Silicon Valley, who has money, to talk about Seneca because it's a mirror image of them. You know, the, the, the greatest hypocrite of the ancient world walking around like with his wealth going, we should not really think about wealth. Silicon Valley can do that because it's the mirror image. It's not so popular to be Cleanthes, you know, mentally disabled, poor, and say that virtue is really important. I don't see Silicon Valley like promoting that. And I think there's good reasons for that. A good question, Camilla, a very hard question. Are they? They were, yeah, they are, make me think. Keep, it's a Sunday. Keep you on your toes. They are on a Sunday, <laughs> blink it out. <laughs> it's because you might pick your ball, isn't it? <laughs> okay, next one is, I. Uh, it's more of a request for uh, clarification because I didn't uh, understand what you're saying here. So uh, when you say that Fitzine or eudaimonia is a destination rather than a journey, uh, that you either reach it or you don't, what do you mean? Um, for example, so I, I think I said this to Eve recently. Sorry to use you again, Eve. I said I think I said something like you're either in Miami or you're not. If you're not in Miami, you're not in Miami. You can't. You can say I'm close to Miami. I go, yeah, but are you there? No. So this is why you know stoicism is really black and white. You're either in Miami or you're not, or you're in Hemel Hempstead or you're not. So am I in Hemel Hempstead? No. Where am I? I'm in Albuquerque, right? So yeah, Paul is from sitting in Hemel Hempstead. So if I'm one mile from Hemel Hempstead, I mean, am I in Hemel Hempstead? No. And this whole thing, again, the self-help idea is that we should all progress, right? And therefore we're getting closer to eudaimonia. But actually in stoic sense, you're not, it doesn't matter how close, you can't, you're either there or you're not. It's a completely irrelevant thing. It's a very modern concept of life, but I'm getting closer. That doesn't mean that one shouldn't, act, shouldn't. I often say um, that we should all, all look towards eudaimonia our journeys are all different. Like your, your, your path may be longer. It, it may be steeper. It may be more, you know, twisting and turning than mine. Definitely. To say that Cleanthes had a life as easy as, say, Marcus Aurelius is, again, to miss the point. But I think they both looked in that direction. So we can say we can all look in the direction of Eudemonia, but you're either there or you're not, which is why they say it's so rare to achieve it. Or the only, you know, Aristotle says the man who's achieved this in the graveyard. And I think there's actually some sense of truth in that. That we are so, you know, we're so used to uh, having a, a goalpost or a milestone is very modern concept, right? Rather than having an art, when you're finishing, you basically finish the artwork you've done and it's done. You don't really talk about it whilst you're in the process, you just do it. And but we're so used to in the modern contemporary sense of like, well, I'm nearly there. I'm 10% better than I was. Like, I'm 1% better today than I was yesterday. That is not, I mean, I love it because people, James Clear just did a bit on the Daily Stoic podcast about using Stoicism to be 1% better. I mean, that's just, that's just misunderstanding Stoicism entirely. I mean, I like the idea and I congratulate people for doing it because I think it's good that, that people put Stoicism in terms that people who are not, who are new to Stoicism understand, but that's not Stoic to say. It doesn't make any sense. Doesn't that um, diminish the importance of the journey though? I mean, I know that you know you can't be sort of a, maybe you're not virtue 100%, uh, but you, you are working towards it. And it seems to me that, I don't know whether I misunderstood you or to. I mean, you have to distinguish between doing the right reason, doing the right thing for the right reason and reaching eudaimonia. They're not the same thing. I mean, this again, this is Juliana. So I'm not, I mean, I'm sounding very clever here, but it just proves that I'm, I've read a book. Like I've read Juliana's book. It doesn't prove anything else, right? It's just to clarify. I've just spent a lot of time reading it. It doesn't mean I'm smarter. But I think we need to distinguish, and we don't do that very well in the contemporary sense, between having reached Eudaimonia and doing the right thing for the right thing for the right reason. Now, if you're like, but I want to be closer, then the Stokes are like, but you've missed the point. Like, you should be doing it regardless if you've been it closer or not. Again, this concept is not a concept that they have. So it's quite difficult. It's like, I know you speak various languages, but you imagine using an English to explain a very Italian concept, not an Italian word, but an Italian concept. And that's why I'm struggling because it's really hard to go, right, this concept that we have just doesn't exist in Stoicism. And the problem is that when we create modern material where we kind of, hybrid it what we're doing is we're smudging it for our own benefit which is great i mean it's, it's great to be like yes but it matters to me but for the stoics it, it, it didn't he said you're still drowning i mean that's pretty harsh i mean this is not me mincing you know it's epitaphs i'm mentioning his words so if we can distinguish between doing the right thing for the right reason and that's where the journey and you and i would agree from having obtained stagehood because that's the thing eudaimonia is achieving stagehood so if we're comfortable with the fact that we may never reach stagehood but we will do all we can to get there. 
that's okay. If we suddenly get upset because we're not, we're like, but I'm 5% more sage than I was last week. <laughs> this is this is the problem. And I know that you're asking me really hard questions. So if anybody had wants to ask a question now, I would say it was a good time to, particularly on that subject. Does anybody feel like they need to know something right now? Because otherwise we're going to go off and I think it's better to answer it now. Anybody? From what I just said? We, we can, yeah, we, we can give a chance to uh, ask yeah. questions in a, in a minute. I've, I've only got, uh, thanks for that. So I, I get it, so it's a bit like Nibana. I'm of. not an expert, so you'd have to tell I'm just me. joking, I'm just kidding. I, I don't know anything about okay. Nibana. Sorry, so um, anything. next one, it's more of a, uh, I guess it's more of an observation. Um, so you, you rightly say that stoicism is not a life hack. It's not about just call, call, courage because Courage in and of itself is not just sufficient. Uh, you need all the other virtues and stuff. And I understand that. Uh, and, and yet you uh, mentioned the fact that, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, you uh, discovered stoicism after your uh, beloved grandma, uh, Sheila, died. And also uh, Leo, in his dedication to, at the beginning of the book, he talks about certain Marian. And he says that she um, faced pain, illness, and death like a stoic. And I'm just wondering whether we who are passionate about stoicism, who love stoicism, are uh, sort of instrumentally in, perp in perpetuating this, this stereotype around stoicism, because it is a bit of a cliche that we all discovered stoicism, I, and I'm the same, you know, I've discovered stoicism after, you know, sentimental, uh, um, yeah, uh, break, after a breakup. Uh, and you hear of, you know, all sorts of stuff, you know, generally after a crisis. So I'm just wondering whether we kind of guilty of, uh, of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's very okay. self-indulgent, cool. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think the same reason people embrace religion, you find, that you could, what you have no longer, what you have in, what you've had so far no longer serves you because you've, I think it's only at that point when you have an intense, really intense breakup. It's not the breakup per se, it's your whole life that you've imagined and believed in and constructed and then realized, for example, when someone dies or there's, there's an indefinite breakup, I can't create memories with this person anymore. And yet this time two weeks ago, I was imagining whatever you were imagining. So, I think obviously it's it, it's, very... Sorry, it's very much about, about an inward looking dimension, isn't it? As opposed to the uh, to the pro-social uh, aspect, which is very much outward looking. Uh, well, whenever you suffer a crisis, it's about you, me, 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 uh, yes. me suffering some sort of uh, problem. Yeah, absolutely. I would say not in every case. There are certainly cases where that's not, not but I can honestly say in mine, yes. When I realized uh, via my you know, dad telling me, when I, when I was, you know, I cried for two minutes when she died and he said to me something really profound. And he doesn't speak very often, like literally the guy, I mean, I can na I name like two conversations. Whenever I call my mum, it's like, mom, or dad is mum there, right? So we really don't talk that much. But he said, sometimes we cry, not because we miss the person, but because we are selfish and we want them for ourselves. Are you crying because you want her for yourself? Or are you crying because for, for her? You know, and he didn't, he was, again, like he didn't answer anything, he just said that. And I thought, no, I'm just crying because I feel sorry for myself. And from that moment I said, right, I'm going to remember her as she was. I'm going to walk, you know, walk the best I can in my own shoes to, to make her, you know, to make her memory live on. The only way that I can continue to have memories with that person is to live some of their example. So that was really helpful. But of course, it's self-indulgent. And I, I guess that we have to get to that point where we heal ourselves and realize that the problem is our, you know, our attitude, potentially. And then we, when we have that headspace, which as I said, it's self-help in order to have headspace to help others. The problem with the contemporary movement at the moment, and I guess Tim LeBond can tell me what he thinks when he, because he looks at these kind of questions, is are we only using stoicism to help ourselves or are we asking ourselves a bigger question? I think, sorry, Tim, to, to, I don't know if you're still here, but to use your questions, but like, I'd like to see questions about how people view stoicism to help others, which I haven't seen. And you might, they might, you know, either you might have changed the questions recently, I don't know, but I think that's fundamental. But that's a process, we're all, we're all going to collectively, like Eve, you and me, I mean, five years ago, you couldn't possibly have imagined how big necessarily stoicism would have got. So, I mean, I'm also in those teething, you know, teething problems and growing pains as well. 
Um, and of course, Azzini himself, he started the trend, isn't it? Because as you mentioned in the book, you said, um, I made a prosperous voyage when I was shipwrecked. There you go, we blame him, but yeah, let's break the foul down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> makes me look bad. <laughs> okay, my last question, you'd be happy to hear. Um, so at the very end of the book, last chapter, you say, this is why stoicism isn't really about personal development, but rather the effort made to know who you are and what you must do to create a harmonious world. Why is it, I think you may have, uh, reply to that uh, earlier on, but why is it not about personal development? Because I, I thought that season was very much about personal development. I think Maybe my, I, I got that. Yeah, so I, it's not that there's no personal development done, but that's not the point, right? It's like when you say, what is the point of doing something? And you say, oh, the point isn't to say, hang a, hang a painting on a wall. I'm just looking at a painting. The point is to make your room look nice. But we focus so much on, oh yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this particular bit of wall. I'm gonna use this hammer. And actually the whole point of putting the painting on the wall was to make the room look nice. That was the point. So again, stoicism is not that we cannot, as a process, personal development, but uh, personally develop. But that is not the reason. That's not doing necessarily the right thing for the right reason. So it's not that that doesn't happen, but that should be just, it's just, that's the method in which that you improve society. Again, Zeno talks about the ideal, stoic society he does not talk about the ideal stoic individual it, it doesn't and that's why if we focus if we take but, but the idea sorry the, the idea process, sorry the, the sorry to interrupt the idea of stoic is instrumental to to create a, an ideal society isn't it so if i decide to work on myself because i want to improve my sense of justice as in you know one of the virtues and be more pro-social more altruistic more generous more contributing to the society in general that that's personal development isn't it yeah it's just a it's just not the it's just the, not the be all and end all so i i think that again it's a very good question that you've asked me to clarify because otherwise if i didn't clarify you could come to the conclusion that i'm thinking we should just you know be ignorant individuals uh, but it really is like that if you take the thing i want to be more just then by definition you're looking outwards right and then you then work on yourself to do that it's very hard to be just to yourself sitting in a room. I mean, you could be just to yourself, you know, like, you know, for example, I might get something wrong. Like when you corrected me about, you know, this sentence needs to be adapted slightly to identify Seneca as actually the origin of that paraphrase. So please do that. I could have beaten myself up about that. Oh my gosh, how can it's power possible that Carmelo knows more about Seneca than me? But I was like, great. Carmelo knows more about Seneca than me. <laughs> Just, <laughs> he knows that, and that's great. And it's a different attitude, right? So I didn't beat myself up about it because it's not particularly strict to do that. But in the most, and it wouldn't be very fair for me, you know, to do it to myself. It's not really beneficial. It's just watering yourself pity. But um, like most of the time, like when we look out, we look to justice. It's to do with how we deal with other people, right? So I guess if I was being very Dr. Kai on you as an academic or Professor Kai, I might have been like, well, and I might have just given you loads of excuses that I, and I thought, well, I can't, I just have to admit that, I'm, that he's right. No, you and didn't I've seen academics. Well. I've seen academics do all sorts of acrobat, acrobatic maneuvers to kind of show that you're not necessarily right. And I just think that's just not very polite. No, you didn't, you were a gentleman about it. Thank you. Um, so I think we've got 10 minutes before, that, that's it. You were very patient. Thank you very much. Um, so we, we only got 10 minutes before we take a break. So I'd say, if there's anyone who's had the chance to read Kite's book and has got a passion question, please uh, come forward. Let me see if I see, if you can raise your hand. Or anybody, I, I guess, who yeah. wants to who wants to read it and wants to ask a question, I guess, if they haven't, because they might not have done, because I know there's been some, because of the Swiss Canal, we've had some issues. Um, so if you wanted to read it, but you're not sure, you're like on the fence about it, is there any question you want to ask? I think that's also fair. Well, otherwise, we can just proceed with you, uh, with you, know, with you asking the audience question, questions. Oh, I will see a, a raised hand. Josh, uh, back up. Um, hi, yeah, so I, I ordered my copy and after um, seeing this talk and checking it out. So I want to read it, I haven't read it yet. Um, I'm curious about, uh, I'm a person who's very much devoted to what I would call tikkun olam, a Hebrew phrase for repairing the world. And I'm curious about the question you were raising earlier about government. And I, I'm curious in particular about when we recognize you know, that I may be a Stoic and people in this room are a Stoic, but the people with whom we're trying to coordinate 
are not necessarily Stoics. I'm curious if that would change your answer about anarchy versus one of these other strategies, or if that doesn't matter. I mean, you, Camilo asked me a very specific question, and I, I completely accept it. So I'll just, he asked me specifically, does Stoicism do this, right? So if the world isn't Stoic, then I'm, I need to be realistic about that, right? As you're rightly pointing out, I need to be realistic about possibly the word anarchy would confuse people and perhaps just a bit too late for anarchy. And yes, what do I do in, in, when I have a situation where, you know, 99.9% .9 of the world isn't actually stoic? Then yes, I have to ad adapt accordingly, which is why in our book, we say things like, we don't give you the answer. We're not the best place to give the answer, right? The best place person is you. Right. So people will say to me, what should I do, for example, if should I should I become prime minister or the president or should I become, you know, should I instead of becoming a politician, should I become an activist or should I, you know, should I become a lecturer or should I be, you know, should I just make sure my kids are taught really well? And it's like, well, you know the answer to that better than I do. I don't know your children. I don't know how many children you have. I don't know how if it's possible for you to do that. I don't know if you want to become prime minister. I personally don't. Right now, I can't see myself right now looking forward to doing that. So that would be, you know, that's why I'm saying the questions that you ask yourself is how best can I see um, economic justice folding out? Would it be best to have a, you know, within a capitalist framework, distinguish between capitalism and neoliberalism, which is an issue, have a more socialistic, you know, bent based on like a national health service? Do you have something like universal basic income? This is, but now you're working into my day job. Do you have universal basic services? That is my day job. Um, like, do, do we, you know, how best to manage that? And this is why Stoicism offers the great tool called Socratic you know, dialectic or Socratic dialogue. So basically you and I, Joshua, would have a discussion about how best to do that, given what you like, what you don't like what you want to do, what your skill set is, what you're willing to learn, what poisons you're willing to swallow, which poisons you definitely want to avoid. Because whatever choice we make, they're going to be poisons to swallow, right? That's why Epitaphus says, never sell yourself cheap. So I know it's, a, it's kind of like a cop-out, like what would you do? But it's just like, what would you do, Joshua? And then what we would do, we would discuss based on your proclivities and your preferences, like what is the best option for you? But yes, you're absolutely right. To just come over, this is the direct solution, isn't particularly helpful. Does that answer your question, Joshua? I'm not sure. I would say it addresses my question and to, to show the perspective behind my question, I, I, I'm a Stoic, I haven't read a lot of it. I read some of the, you know, the notes on Epictetus in college and that gave me a sort of very self-deterministic approach to the world, exactly what you're talking about. But now I'm um, a social scientist interested in an engineering perspective. So we have to think about systems design and there come, quest there come times when you sort of have to make decisions for other people when you think about governance and stuff, which is something I've always uh, been challenged with. And fortunately, I'm not in government, I'm just an academic, but that, those are some of the things that I've been thinking about. Yeah, yeah so I guess like it's very difficult with systems, but we can still do, we can still ask the questions like, okay, what would a just system look like? And who, in order to make it just, who would, who would quote unquote, to use again a Marxist frame, who would suffer if I change the system? How can I minimize that? what people would call suffering. We would say that was a false impression, but that doesn't mean, this is why I say that if we, I've written a paper where I can send it, if you email me, I'll send it to you, where I work with a Marxist uh, thinker to show that we could learn in Stoicism something from Marxist framing and they could learn something from us. So I'm really not much of a, let's only stay in our, our stoic circle. It's like, well, what can we learn from Marxist framing? Because the people do frame the world according to hedonic principles. That doesn't mean that we necessarily agree with them, but if we don't understand how they feel, we can't really come across with a reasonable explanation about or a solution, right? Because we're, we're assuming that they agree with something which they don't understand, or vice versa. Thanks That's that. really interesting. Uh, Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry. Uh, I can see Tim has got a question. Could you lower your hand, Joshua? Hi, hi, uh, Kai. Uh, great to see you. And uh, so first of all, I'd like to uh, congratulate you on writing the book and encourage everyone here to, to get hold of Kai's book and to read it, because uh, you're so passionate about the subject. And also, it's a very clear book, I think. Uh, so uh, I, I just I just want to give you a... I'll, yeah, I, I wonder if you could spend three minutes summarising 
what's in your book? I know that's a really hard question, and I, I, I didn't, you didn't know I was going to ask you that. So I know there's lots of historical examples. You talk about some of the lesser known Stoics, you cover a lot of topics. So just for someone here who's kind of saying, oh, that's quite an interesting idea. Shall I read Kai's book? Could you just spend two or three minutes sharing what, what's in the book? I'm going to just say quickly, I've just read your message, Eve. Thank you for being here. Um, yeah, thanks for coming in. God, that's the hardest question of the day, isn't it? Three minutes, give me academic, give me academic 30 minutes, they're better off. <laughs> but yeah, in a three minutes, I guess the core message is what is virtue and what is virtue ethics? So how does one navigate the world when they believe that the four historic virtues are fundamental, that they are what is good and what is good not only for themselves, but for society? And what do you do when you realize that the, the polar opposites of those virtues are vicious, not because they're bad for you. So greed would be the opposite, right? <clears throat> of self-control. So greed not only is bad for you, but, what, but is bad for society. What does that look like, right? Because we talk a lot about these, these key principles. And then we say, okay, everything else is an indifferent. What does that mean? So we're taking those core concepts of what it is to be good for yourself and society, what is to be bad, what is bad for yourself and society, and say so what we're basically, to use a mass and polluji phrase, cashing that out in ways that you can see in the contemporary sense what a just um, application of, say, economic principles would look like, how a spirit, how one can look at justice towards the environment using stoic uh, theory and theology. So we use those, we use sort of day-to-day -day examples. I'll give you one. We say that war is indifferent. And we do that through two examples. And we say that these are our stoic quote unquote heroes. One of them is a British spy called Catherine Gunn who was against the Iraq war. She thought it was unjust because it was involving a UN, you know, breaking of a UN resolution. The other example is Pat Tillman. He's an American who went to, this, who went to war in the US Army. There's two people that we say are our heroes. One tried to stop the war and one went to the war to fight. And this is what we're saying is, is key in stoicism. It depends on what your role is. That's why there's no kind of answer. So I don't know if that's a three minutes, but we're saying we are providing you contemporary examples so that you can really understand what is virtue in the contemporary sense, what an indifference means and how stoicism evolved from Zeno's thinking to Marcus Aurelius' thinking, because we in the academic world, we say about the early Stoics and the middle Stoics and the late Stoics, but that's really for our own benefit as academics. It really doesn't work that way. It's a much more sort of journey through Stoicism so that you can reflect on your own journey in life. I don't know, Tim, if I did that justice and you really caught me on the spot, so I'm glad you did it. I, I think you did brilliantly, uh, Kai. <laughs> I'm gonna and, do it to you next one, time, you one watch. Thing I, one thing I'd <laughs> emphasize from that, I suppose, is that uh, a lot of modern Stoics, probably including myself, uh, do tend to emphasize the Roman Stoics. And of course, that's partly because the Roman Stoics left us much more of their writings. Uh, and so we, we know more what they said. But one of the things that you do in your book, I think, is talk about some of the earliest Stoics as well, don't you? Which is, I think, a really, a really important thing to do. So thank you for that. It's, it's hard, isn't it, with the fragments? I think that part of the challenge is that, um, again, this is thanks to Leonidas Konstantikov's not particularly me, is to be able to go through those fragments and pull out like the tiniest sentence from one place and find out another one that corresponds in a completely different place. So it's actually a really hard skill to do, um, which is also why people focus on the sort of Roman uh, flavored philosophy. Also because the Romans were much more about, it's funny, but they're much more about the self, whereas the Greeks are much more about the cosmopolis. So I think, again, because there's an emphasis by Silicon Valley over the, of the Roman self, because the Roman identity as a self was important, by the Spartan identity. And uh, again, we just spoke about this, that when you said I was Athenian, that was really important to you, which is why appetizers do not say I'm Athenian, do not say I'm from Corinth, right? Because that was your fundamental primary identity in the Greek world. It was which city state do you belong to? And what does that say about you? Whereas now we say, the first thing I say is my name is Kai. I don't say I am British. That's definitely not the first thing that I say. Whereas the Romans, the Romans if you, as long as you were Roman, that was the only thing that mattered. You're either Roman or you were. And so then the individual uh, becomes much more important. Does that answer, does that help to like, explain? I know I'm not explaining to you, I've been for the general population. Yeah, no, I think that's really good points. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tim.
Great. So I, I'd say we take, we take a break uh, and we reconvene at, at, at 10 past, if that's okay. Brilliant. Tim, I'll think of a hard question just for you. <laughs> when you get back. <laughs> kidding, kidding. See, you, see you in a bit. Bye.